I want to start with an apology. It's about something that occurred right here not long ago. I was selling tickets to an auction sponsored by the Task Force for the Hungry. The event was to include a gourmet Italian dinner. And I unwittingly suggested that gourmet Italian might be an oxymoron. <laughs> you need to understand that in the parish of my childhood, no one had roots in places like Italy and Germany and Poland. And certainly not in Dixie, God forbid. <laughs> All these people had churches of their own. I've told you how, before how things were back then. That's when my family practiced tithing, but never got very good at it. <laughs> and that's when my father gave me a nickel for my Sunday school offering, and I always wondered why some kids were being charged a dime. <laughs> Sunday school was okay, but hardly worth a dime. Bishop and I, by the way, have much in common, you know. Obviously, we're of the same faith. <laughs> Although he seems to have taken it to higher levels. <laughs> More interesting to me, Bishop George Wayne Smith likes to be called Wayne, and layperson Charles Judd Holt likes to be called Judd. <laughs> Our paths often crossed during the search for Jake. That's when we came to know one another on a second name basis. <laughs> Dearly beloved, the bishop begins. He likes to start that way. I guess it softens us up for what might follow. But don't worry, it's not, it's not about money. Not this time. Dearly beloved, as you know, the mainstay of our worship is the Red Book of Common Prayer. Yet, it has become clear that in Episcopal homes, this great resource has fallen into general disuse. <laughs> I am troubled and saddened by this development. I have decided that until further notice, all references will be to the unread Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> I look forward to greeting you on my next visit to insert the name of your parish here. <laughs> but I see Paul as a tragic character. Remember those long letters he wrote? I had at that. No keyboard for Paul. He wrote to the Romans, the Corinthians, the Galatians, and many more wrote to some folks twice. But did anyone ever write back? <laughs> Imagine the poor guy racing out to meet the mailman. <laughs> Anything for me? <laughs> Anything from Rome? Anything from Corinth? Anything for Thessalonia? <laughs> I wrote the Thessalonians twice, you know. <laughs> Strange and wondrous things happened in Emmanuel. On November 11 of last year, I had a revelation. It occurred during the 9 o'clock service. I was reading from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. I suddenly realized why the Thessalonians never wrote back. <laughs> They didn't know what the hell Paul was talking about. I certainly didn't. And I'd like to believe I'm 
as smart as the run-of-the-mill Thessalonian. <laughs> Time was when we sat in our pew and I had no trouble hearing Marie whisper, aren't the Arlford flowers pretty? Or check out the blonde at the green dress. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Last Sunday she said something twice and I still didn't hear. So I twisted around and gave her my good ear and heard her say, you forgot to zip up. <laughs> may surprise you. Marie says I'm the laziest man she knows. <laughs> and it's upsetting because she knows a lot of men. <laughs> Although not intimately. <laughs> I intended to, to conclude my remarks with a song. But considering time constraints, I'll forego that. I guess that makes singing my foregone conclusion. <laughs> what ticks me off is this. I'd have plenty of time if I hadn't agreed to read that damn letter from the bishop. <laughs> Thank you. With the same go marching on Marching on in When the sun